Both sides will have 15 minutes to argue. The appellant may reserve up to five minutes for rebuttal. And if you'd like to reserve some time, let me know when you get started. Um, I'm keeping the clock this morning. We've read the briefs. We're we'll ready to see you later on. Thank you, Your Honor. In the case of court, Mr. Shaker, Clark Cohen's representing Tia Malta, the mother of the appellant in this case. I'd like to reserve five minutes of rebuttal time, please. Uh, we're dealing with a single issue today, which is the issue of abandonment. According to the judgment entry in this case, abandonment, abandonment was the sole basis of the first prong of the permanent custody finding. Um, and abandonment, as you know, is defined under 2151.11c as a 90-day period. There's a presumptive abandonment that occurs in as a 90-day period without contact between parent and child. The courts treat this as a bright line test, according to the cases that I cited in my brief notably Samuel Wright case from the 5th District. I would like to point out that all of the state's cases cited in its brief, every single one of them is distinguishable from this case because each one of those cases have clear 90-day periods which are minimally or not even contested. This case is not like that. At uh, page 45 and 46 of the transcript, during the cross-examination of the caseworker, the caseworker discusses uh, Tia Malta's request for visitation at the jail, and she says at that point in the testimony that she, or that is to say, presumably the agency, is, quote, not opposed to such visitation. Not opposed is the phrase that she used. But she denied it, she said, because mom, quote, wasn't making any effort, unquote, on the case plan. Now that's what you say, not opposed to visitation, you mean mom, mother was incarcerated? Or well, not what? all I know is what that what she said and what she said when she was asked about whether she and or the agency was opposed to visitation in that situation was, we're not opposed to it, but mom wasn't working the case plan, so I didn't offer it to her and say she could do it. But that is different testimony from what she said in direct, because in direct, at page 14, she indicated that she represented Tia Malta while she was in jail, uh, that her visits were suspended. That was the language she used. Your visits are suspended. Uh, while you're in jail. So at that point, Ms. Malta would have assumed that, oh, I, I don't get any visitations because they've been suspended by the agency. Is that statement made in reference to the first period of incarceration or the second period of incarceration? Well, that's an interesting question because the periods, there were periods of incarceration going back to the summer. I don't know if you're referring to them as the first period. Right. The, the period at issue is the period of January because the uh, basis of the abandonment period, the operative dates are October either 23rd or 21st. The court used the term, used the date of 23rd as the last visit. If you look at the transcript, it indicates possibly it was the 21st. It has to come from October, late the third week in October, up to April 7th, which is the date of filing the permanent custody. And so you've got two ways to get there. January falls right in the middle. There are no dates whatsoever given by the party in the burden of proof in this case, CSB, as to which dates in January apply. But it could not have been, it's impossible for it to have been the period from January to April because it would have had the period, the date of the request for visitation would have had to be New Year's Day. And I doubt very much that a caseworker would have gone down to the jail on New Year's Day to have this discussion with Ms. Walton. If it were the period from October 21st or 23rd, going forward 90 days, the, the date you end up with is the third week of January, the 19th or the 21st. So, the request for visitation could not have come after that date. That means chances are three to one that it didn't occur at the proper time because three weeks passed during which if it had been requested, it would have been interrupted the night of the period. But the fact is, it doesn't so, matter. But those are, okay, I, I understand. You're saying it was the state's uh, or the agency's uh, burden to yes. establish the 90 days. And what you're saying is not that they completely failed with their evidence that it could not be that way. It's just that it's not very likely because they were sort of sloppy in the presentation of the dates. I'm, I'm saying more than it's not very likely. I'm saying that it wasn't proven by clear and convincing evidence by the party who had the burden of proof. And therefore, it cannot be found by the court to, to have happened. Um, the state to, seems to argue that the nine days is not the only way in which you can prove by clear and convincing evidence uh, I don't recall what the argument was. There isn't any other way under uh, the, the facts as cited by the court in its judgment entry because she's 
sites and dates as establishing a 90-day window. And all the case law that we looked at deals with the 90-day period, which you don't have. Uh, you don't have proof of it. Uh, the case rests on the burden of proof. If it could be proven, which it wasn't, that there was a request outside the 90-day period, and if that date had been established, the request for visitation would act as a rebuttal of the presumption because uh, abandonment is an intentional act. That's basically the argument that I would uh, take questions if there are any. Well, I guess uh, if we assume your position that the request would interrupt the service of interruption in the United does it follow that the agency is required to uh, bring the child to the institution for visitation? It's immaterial because the issue is whether or not there has been an abandonment, not whether or not the agency has within its rights to deny visitation. Uh, the, the evidence suggests that visitation was in fact denied because the caseworker said two different things, but each of them amounts to a denial by the agency of visitation. Uh, either due to the incarceration or due to the fact that she hadn't been uh, you know, successful in working her case plan according to the opinion of the caseworker. Either one is a denial by the agency of visitation. Either one, uh, according to the case law that I cited in my brief, would act as a, uh, a demonstration that in fact there had not been an intentional amendment. So, let me create that this, you know, these are not the facts of this case, but let me create a hypothetical that you have an individual who has a case plan and has done nothing, absolutely nothing on the case plan, hasn't shown up at the hearings, uh, has been in and out of jail, you know, sentenced to prison, and does nothing except uh, when visited by the caseworker says, by the way, you know, I haven't visited my child in, you know, however many, two years, but I don't want you to bring the child here now that I'm incarcerated. And that is within the 90-day period. Where are we? We're in a case, what you're talking about is a situation that's inapplicable to the judgment entry which is being appealed because the judgment entry cites one and only one basis for the first problem of the permanent custody decision, and that is abandonment. It does not cite any other reasons for its problem one. Uh, the obligation of the court is to state uh, the clear and convincing evidence which has been presented to it. There was no such evidence presented, and the court found something that wasn't, in fact, consonant with the evidence that was presented. Thank you. Because the court could have found, and I think the, the agency does argue, that the court found that the child could not. Well, I mean, the, the argument that we made uh, was not that the child should be placed with the parent, but that the child should be placed with the grandparent. Well, I understand that I'm saying the mind of the court could have been what they're saying the court did that, that there could have been a finding of could not or should not. Well, the, the burden for presenting the evidence on that, on that issue would be the state's burden by clear and convincing evidence. And when we do not have a judgment entry or a transcript, uh, or at least a judgment entry which demonstrates uh, the basis, I don't think you have a choice but to reverse. I mean, you're talking about a harmless error kind of argument. That, uh, I'm saying I understand that as an argument. Yeah, I, I don't see how well, that... No, obviously you need to address it. I don't know what, what else I can add to that. Is that it? Okay, I reserve the remainder of my time. Thank you. May it please the court, Mr. Owen, Stephen Shaker, on behalf of the Appellate Wayne County Children's Services. Uh, I guess the issue, as I see it in this case, is a little. Um, Mr. Owens is. Um, arguing at this point in time that just the act of requesting visitation is enough to end that 90-day period. I think I, what I gathered from the court's judgment entry and also looking at the cases, it's not just the act of asking, but whether the denial of visitation, which appears
appears to have occurred, according to the caseworker's um, statements on page 14, whether that denial um, acts to end the 90-day period running from October 23rd, 13 through April 2nd, um, 2014. And the reason that I, I think I phrase it as a denial, I think there's sufficient case law that says just the act of reaching out and requesting visitation, um, if it's not legitimate, like you are in jail, it is in itself not enough. I mean, you can still be abandoned um, in well, case. How, um, okay, so you're saying that it's not just the act, the, um, the act of asking for visitation, we look at the look at the denial, but the denial is not within the control of the mother. All she can do is ask. So how, how is is asking inconsistent with the concept of um, abandonment? I think if you are asking and it uh, going back to the case I listed, in rate DP, in rate LD, in rate Cravens, in rate Katrina. All, all those cases they talked about, in rate DP, mother contacting case worker to set up visitation was insufficient to rebut the presumption of abandonment. Um, in rate Katrina, sixth district case, um, mother called case worker and left messages that she wanted to visit her daughters was insufficient to rebut abandonment presumption when she failed to leave phone number or appear or appear for scheduled visitation. I guess I want I, there's an analogy here that when mother was offered visitation, when she was available for it, she didn't follow through. When she was in jail and she was visited, and there's a Penelope of logistical problems with bringing a child to the jail. I know some agencies may do it, but it's not a realistic request. It's akin to calling children's services and saying, hey, I want to visit, but not providing a phone. Well, I mean, there's all kinds of hypotheticals you can have in that situation. And let's say, um, you know, there was, um, there was visitation all the way through the case. And then a parent is incarcerated for 90 days, and they get that out. preceding the permanent custody motion. That there wasn't, I don't believe, when she was in jail in January, I think the caseworker mentioned or, or alluded to that it was a short period. I don't believe she was in jail for 90 days. So that is a little different from this, from your hypothetical, and I do think that there's probably case law that addresses that. I believe the, the number of cases I cited regarding just asking for visitation in it not being a, I guess, to your question, not being a realistic or a, uh, a, a request that's capable of being carried out, um, I think this case is akin to that. Well, what do we do with, uh, we haven't seen the, this part of the this item, uh, the uh, latter clarity in the testimony about the dates where it's the state's burden to uh, prove this element by clear and convincing evidence. Your Honor, I can tell you from my review of the record, I, I absolutely concur that the testimony is unclear. Some of the letters and documents, I think, do shed light on that. Unfortunately, the, uh, they have an acronym for it that CC or something that, that was entered into evidence. I, of course, wasn't, wasn't able to get it from children's services, but I believe it was in the court's record that went into Akron, may illuminate some of those things. And I think that's where, um, 
again, I, unfortunately, I know Mr. Evans put this in his brief. Uh, should have, of course, looked at this previously, but on the second go round, certain things weren't available to us. I, you know, I, I, I hope that there's something there that justifies the court's decision. And, and, and along those lines, um, a case that Mother cites, in Ray DJ from the Fifth District, cites for the proposition that the court recognizes that if the father attempted to visit DJ but was prevented from doing so by the job and family services, um, it would be difficult to conclude that the actions were made. In that case, the Fifth District resolved that, that issue by deferring to the trial court. Uh, their, their quote, the Fifth District concluded that the trial court in the case after hearing testimony did not find that Job and Family Services interfered with the father's attempts at visitation. And, and defer to that trial court's finding if there's something there. I, I do believe that there, I mean, from the record it is a little unclear from the transcript. Uh, from the entire record I can't speak to everything that's in those letters because they weren't there. So if the police were said, uh, This court finds that E10 applies. If you look up E10, it is abandoned. 
It's the same argument. So that was the only, and the earlier question by Judge Carr was about, there may be something else applies. Well, that's what else applied, and it was the same thing. Um, the argument that it is not really the period of abandonment that is important, but whether the denial of visitation had some sort of legitimacy to it. If, if Mr. Shaker wanted to make that argument, why did he not cite a single case which stands for that principle? Each one of the cases that he cited, and I have them right here, deals with a situation where um, there is a clear period of 90 days. The case of Watson versus Richland County, the child was five years old. The father was absent for almost the entire life of that child because he was in prison, not just a misdemeanor jail, but in prison for five years. Um, the matter of Katrina D, the period of separation was September 13th of 2001 to January 23rd of 2002, a period of four months. Uh, Inri DP, April 1st, 05 to November 4th, a period of seven months. Uh, Inri Cravens, the period was February 6th of 03 to 6-12 of 03, a period of four months. So there wasn't a single case cited in which that period of 90 days was in fact contested as it is here. What we have here is not a problem of, we really don't have the issue of rebuttal of the presumption so much as we do not have a basis for the presumption. And the presumption is what was used by the court in the judgment's entry incorrectly. Um, unless there's a question, that's pretty much what I have to do. Thank you. Thank you both for your presentations this morning. The court will take the matter in your file and issue a decision which will be available as well as possible. Thank you.